Hello, I'm Judy Woodruff. The Securities and Exchange Commission image has been badly tarnished for failing to catch the Bernard Madoff Ponzi scheme. Add to that budget cuts, which have hurt its ability to enforce investor protections. Mary Shapiro is the first woman to be chairman of the SEC. She says she aims to strengthen the commission and to restore its reputation. I sat down with Mary Shapiro after her first seven months on the job here at the SEC. We talked about the many challenges she faces and what she plans to do about them. Mary Shapiro, thank you very much for talking with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. You took over as chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the middle of what is the worst financial crisis in this country in decades at a very low point in American people's confidence in the securities industry. Was the SEC asleep at the switch? I don't think I would describe it as a sleep at the switch. What I do think is that um, the agency went through a very difficult period over the last couple of years. And we've worked very hard in the six months or so that we've been on board to really restore investors' confidence in the SEC. The American public needs an SEC that is aggressive on enforcement, that's willing to engage in rulemaking to ensure that the playing field is level for them to participate in the markets, uh, one that's looking around the corner to make sure that we're aware of the risks that may threaten in the future. And we've been working very hard to do all of those things. It's clear the implication is that there were some problems here. What broadly do you see yourself uh, as needing to do to fix those problems? Well, I think there are a couple things. One is that you might remember that it was really just a little over a year ago when everyone was mostly worried about America's competitiveness. And there was a lot of pressure on the SEC to not be such a rigorous enforcement agency, not to do too many rules because it was driving business overseas. And, and so we've had to really reverse course. And while we still care very much about competitiveness, we really have to put the investor back at the center of everything we do here. So so the rulemaking that we've engaged in in the last six months in, in very broad areas from um, facilitating the ability of shareholders to nominate directors to corporate boards to trying to build the resilience of money market funds to um, trying to improve the controls over customer assets that are held by investment advisors. Those things and more are all about putting the investor first in the SEC's thinking on every single issue. One of the, well, the, well, the most famous violations so far that the SEC was not uh, aware of, that did not bring to light, was the Bernard Madoff scandal. Now the SEC's uh, Inspector General ha is coming out with a report. Uh, the, we understand you've been briefed on it. What does it say? Well, obviously, the, the report will be made public. That's one of my commitments so that, that everybody can understand and learn from the experience of the SEC in handling the Bernard Madoff matter. Um, and, but what I think is really important here, so we'll, we'll all see that when it becomes public, is that we didn't want to wait um, for six or seven months until that report was done in order to start to make really pretty dramatic changes in how the SEC operates. So we've engaged in a couple of things that I think are really critical. One is we brought in a new enforcement director with prosecutorial experience, um, a very aggressive former US, uh, assistant U.S. attorney who's been um, working with our enforcement division to really streamline it its processes so we can bring cases faster, we can bring, bring bigger cases arising right out of the financial crisis. We stopped more Ponzi schemes in the first six months of this year, about three times as many as during the same period last year. Um, we're specializing our enforcement teams so that they will be quicker to respond to issues as they arise. Uh, we've put new rules in place um, or have, are in the process of putting new rules in place that will help protect customer assets that are held by investment advisors like Bernard Madoff. You know, one of the things people don't realize is that this agency of just 3,600 people receives between 750,000 and a million and a half tips and complaints every year. And we had no mechanism for centralizing those tips, to, for analyzing them, for prioritizing them to, to investigate and bring enforcement cases about. And there's a long list of, of changes and things that we've put in place as a response to the agencies not um, discovering the Madoff fraud much earlier. Will individuals here, employees of the SEC, be fired over this? Well, we'll have to see what the report says about the conduct of specific SEC employees. Um, before any decisions like that are made. And do you know when it will be made public? That's your 
your decision? In the next it? several weeks, um, it, the report will be made public. It requires actually a vote of the commission in order to do that, but um, I don't have the report yet, so it will obviously um, be a little bit longer. A newer issue, a federal judge in New York uh, says he's still not satisfied with the explanation uh, for this uh, arrangement between the SEC and Bank of America. It's a $33 million payment to settle allegations that Bank of America, uh, in connection with the, the whole Merrill Lynch uh, merger, uh, did not disclose uh, what it knew about these large payments uh, to, uh, to Merrill Lynch uh, top executives. The judge is using very strong language, saying the SEC's rationale is at war with common sense. Right. Uh, was that payment of $33 million sufficient? Um, we, we think it was a fair and reasonable settlement, certainly within the, within the acceptable range. And, but the judge has asked us some very good questions, and we will uh, endeavor to answer those in our next filing, which is due in early September. Is the, isn't the bigger question here whether the Bank, Bank of America told its shareholders everything it knew about these payments. Is that something the SEC can address? Well, what we have alleged is that they failed to disclose in the proxy uh, sufficient information to inform shareholders um, about the payments exactly. And so you're saying the SEC is addressing it already? Yes, that we believe that the case helps to address that. When we come back, how the SEC is stepping up enforcement. Does the SEC have the funds and the people to do the job that you need to do? You know, here? this is a tiny agency, and I think people don't really appreciate that. In the pantheon of federal regulators, we are one of the smallest. And um, if you look at the size of the markets that we regulate, how rapidly they change, the technology they have at their disposal, the number of participants, uh, it's really kind of extraordinary. We regulate about 35,000 entities, 12,000 public companies whose disclosure we regulate, if, even if you take them out of the mix. Um, there are 11,000 investment advisors, there are 5,000 brokerage firms, there's thousands and thousands, 8,000 mutual funds. We have um, a very small number of people to keep up with the rulemaking that's necessary, the policy issues that are necessary, but also to examine all of those entities and to bring enforcement cases. So we need to be, in my view, um, quite a bit larger and more technologically enabled than we are to effectively do our job. So what are the odds that you will catch the next Bernie Madoff? Well, I think some of the things I spoke about earlier that we're trying to put in place, new rules, new training for our employees, some new technology to help us handle tips and complaints, bringing new skill sets into the agency. We're creating a new focus on risk assessment so we can look at those areas of the industry that create the biggest risk for investors. will give us a much better opportunity and a much better chance of catching the next Madoff much earlier. You've just listed a number of things you're already doing, the hiring of the chief enforcement officer very early on. At the same time, there's still some some criticism out there that you've been slow to get the rest of your team in place. You just in the last few days named, the, I guess, the new chief accountant right. for the SEC. Um, is, is this and, and not filling a few other key positions a problem at this juncture? Not really. If you look at the number of positions we filled, and hiring in the government is, is an adventure uh, on a lot of different levels, but um, we have brought in almost 100 percent new senior leadership uh, into the agency. Um, we have two key positions left to fill, the trading and markets director, responsibility for the market structure issues, rating agencies, the um, exchanges, and the um, office of of inspections and examinations. The director of that office just left uh, two weeks ago. So we have those two key positions to fill, but we have a new director of corporation finance, new general counsel, new enforcement director, new head of our New York office, which is the largest of the SEC offices. And um, so we have filled in um, quite a few um, positions um, and, and continue to tackle that very aggressively. The best way for the agency, I think, to move forward is to have very, very strong leadership in all of the areas that we have responsibility for. Different um, issue. Secretary Tim Geithner, Treasury Secretary, recently called uh, uh, you and other regulators, including Sheila Baer at the FDIC, on the carpet for openly criticizing uh, parts of the Obama regulatory reform plan. Does this kind of infighting and opposition inside the administration make it easier for Wall Street and others to basically stop 
uh, well, regulatory reform? I don't know that it makes it easier for them. There are lots of different views in Wall, on Wall Street about what their prop proper approach would be to regulatory reform. But I will say there's so much more agreement within the regulatory community than there is disagreement. I think some of these issues have been a bit blown out of proportion. For example, in the SEC's, uh, from the SEC's perspective, I mean, we, um, we agree with much of what's in um, the administration's plan. I personally agree with the need for a systemic risk regulator. I think it can very appropriately be the Fed. I would like to see it balanced with a stronger council than was proposed, but a council was proposed and a systemic risk regulator was proposed, and we agree with that. We agree so much on the need to regulate hedge funds, on the need to bring over-the-counter derivatives under the regulatory umbrella. We agree with the focus on consumer financial um, products regulation. So there's. frankly, there's much more agreement than there is disagreement, but it's much more fun to talk about the disagreement, I think. It's what makes it into the headlines. Yes, exactly. Uh, one other, I want to get to some of those things you just asked about, but very quickly, an, an issue that's been in the paper in the headlines recently, um, proxy access, allowing investors who control just a fraction of the shares uh, to, to influence company policy. It's been talked about 1%. One, uh, they only have to own 1% of a company, but are you committed to that? Tell me where you are on well, this Well, we've issue. gotten hundreds of comment letters on our proposals on proxy access. And, uh, you know, I would go back to first principles. We think it's really important that the owners of the company, the shareholders, have the opportunity to influence who sits on the board of directors of the company because the board is responsible for overseeing management and they're responsible for, um, for representing the shareholders in the conduct of the corporation's business. And so we've put out a proposal, really two proposals, and um, we're going to wade through the comment letters. They've been enormously thoughtful comments, I have to say. And we may end up in a slightly different place or a very different place. That's what notice and comment is all about. But we are committed to facilitating shareholders' ability to influence who sits on the boards of corporations. So that 1% isn't firm? No, it's a proposal, and when there's lots of comment about that. Executive compensation after the break. You've talked about some of the, so much of the activity that's going on uh, uh, in the markets. Let me ask you about derivatives, an explosive growth we have seen in the trading of these financial instruments. Many of them are barely understood, exotic, um, but they generate huge profits for Wall Street. Should the SEC have a role uh, in policing uh, these instruments. The SEC should absolutely have a role in policing these instruments, particularly where these instruments are economic substitutes for securities. We can regulate the securities, the primary securities markets, but if people can evade that regulation by utilizing a derivative contract, then our actions won't be very effective. So we should have a role and we contemplate that we will have a role. The administration has sent a proposal to Congress. Does it go far enough? It goes quite far, and it will obviously play out on the congressional stage whether it goes far enough, but it does for the very first time bring instruments like credit default swaps under regulation so that both the dealers would be regulated and the over-the-counter instruments that can be standardized will be ha will have a central clearing party, which will do an enormous amount to mitigate credit risk in the system, and it will encourage exchange trading, which will provide tremendous transparency into these instruments. So I think it goes very far. Will there be um, some back and forth about the uh, around the edges and about the nuances? Absolutely. I think the concern that many people have is that is that there's no sign that Wall Street is ready to pull back. And so I think the question in many people's minds, are we going to go back to business as usual? I mean, is there really going to be true legislation, true regulation put in place that will address some of these issues? I really believe there will be legislation. I couldn't tell you what the timing will be. Um, and I really believe there will be vigilant regulation. And I think everything we've done in the last six or seven months at the SEC has, has set us on that path of trying to um, bring real regulatory attention back to issues as diverse as proxy access, um, market regulation and market structure issues. Um, You've mentioned hedge funds. Um, what about uh, getting a handle on what they do? How do you do that? 
Well, they're huge participants in the marketplace, and we really have to understand um, what they're doing sort of on an individual basis and collectively what do they mean um, to the, to, in terms of risk to the entire financial system. So registration of hedge funds, uh, some transparency into their trading practices and strategies, and um, understanding the size of positions uh, that they're taking in the marketplace and the impact that that can be having on the primary markets. Do you have the ability to do what you need to do now? Not now. We sure don't. Um, the SEC a number of years ago tried to register hedge funds. Um, the rule they put in place to do that was thrown out in court. So this requires a legislative change. Executive compensation recently used a provision for the first time to claw back the bonus of a CEO uh, who was not accused of any misconduct. On the other hand, there have been cases involving restatements of financial results where the rule was not enforced. Uh, for example, General Electric, uh, the CEO of AIG, Hank Greenberg. My question is, how are these cases different? What are the guidelines you're using to decide about executive well, compensation these, clawbacks? These, as I said earlier, um, all these cases have to be taken on their individual facts and circumstances. And, and this was the, the first time the agency had used the clawback provision where there was no wrongdoing alleged against the particular CEO. But it's, it's clear, in my view at least, that the provision of the law was really intended to get at conduct that might not be attributable directly to the CEO or the CFO but that happened on their watch um, as a way to ensure their really careful attention to um, their financial statements and, and accounting issues. So um, I, I can't predict whether this is a provision you will see used a lot more often, um, but we felt this was an appropriate case for it. Another, another issue that's arisen, is there anything illegal about a Wall Street firm giving uh, some preferred clients uh, trading tips before they give the information to everybody else. Well, there are lots of issues surrounding that, and as you can imagine, we're looking at those um, very carefully as well. There, there are also issues around um, a, and a concern that we have with respect to um, information going to a subset of clients privately that's inconsistent with public uh, research or information um, from that same firm. So those are issues we're looking at very closely. Up next, credit rating agencies. Credit rating agencies um, blamed for contributing to the housing bubble, for giving the highest ratings uh, to securities that were not uh, solidly financially backed. Right now, there are legal shields that essentially make it very difficult for injured investors to sue them. Why should these firms, these credit rating agencies, continue to enjoy such special protection? It's a great question. It's one we're wrestling with right now, to be perfectly honest. And um, I've said my personal view is, all the commission has not taken a position on that, is that they should be subject to some liability, that that would put uh, tremendously more discipline into the process of ratings. But while we wrestle with that bigger liability question, we are uh, moving ahead with uh, rulemaking that we hope will deal with some of the more problematic ratings practices, including the one that I find most offensive, which is ratings shopping. So if I'm a company and I'm going to structure a product and I want to sell it to the public and I need a rating to do that, I might go to three or four rating agencies and ask them to give me a preliminary rating. And then I might select or likely would select the rating that's the highest and use that um, with which to sell my securities. It's a little bit like going to professors and saying, I'll take your course if you'll give me an A. And we're going to try to deal with um, some of those issues this fall through rulemaking. A couple of questions about you quickly, Mary Shapiro. How different is the environment at the SEC now from what it was back in the early 90s when you were a commissioner? It's, um, the external environment is, is hugely different. Um, having been through the financial crisis, um, dealing with, with the Madoff uh, matter, dealing with the just proliferation of Ponzi schemes and other scams that we're, we're seeing, it's always been um, an enormously professional agency full of dedicated public servants. But I think there's right now a sense of, of just tremendous um, urgency to deal with issues. Twenty years ago, we had lots of important issues to deal with, but, but the external environment uh, was much more benign than I think we're experiencing right now. The issues are huge. Uh, the stresses are huge. Who are some of the people you rely on, both inside and outside, for advice and counsel? 
Well, inside the building, I really rely on, on the experts. Um, so much of what we've done that I've talked about and moved very aggressively in the last six or seven months um, hasn't been what I've done. It's been what the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission has done. And people have worked so hard. And we have tremendously talented people in, in the senior positions as well. And I rely on them. They're the experts. Outside the agency, I've um, relied a lot on my predecessors um, who have been chairmen, who have been very generous with their time and their thinking. Also people who served um, as commissioners at the time I did um, back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Um, and, and people who've just been generous throughout, um, throughout Washington over the years in, in giving me very good advice. So I've, I've really been blessed by a lot of great advisors over the years. I hate to ask this question. You're the first woman to hold this position. Any less stress? I mean, there's been a lot of turnover here. Any less stress because you're a woman? Do you oh, think? oh, no. There's definitely not less stress. I think it's, um, I, I have loved coming back to the SEC. and. Uh, it's been a phenomenal experience, but I will tell you it is a 24-7 job, and uh, the stress is, is tremendous, but I feel like we're making progress, and so that's the reward, that we are really getting back on the path of, of focusing on the investor and what's the, what's the best thing we can do uh, in every area to protect investors. Mary Shapiro, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. And that's our conversation with Mary Shapiro chairman of the SEC. Thanks for watching. I'm Judy Woodruff. We'll see you next time.